Yeah, so let me know if you can see my slides. Does it look good? Annie, you'll just have to speak up because once I go into full screen, I can't actually see the video. I don't see the screen right now, or I don't see oh. the screen. sorry. Yes, okay, I know why, because I need to share. <laughs> I just kind of went into, there we go, Perfect. okay. And now I'm gonna go into full screen. Ah, and now I can still see the video, Wonderful. it's great. All right, thank awesome. you. Yeah, if at any time you don't see it, feel free to shout out or flail your hands. And uh, thank you both Annie and Chris for the warm introduction. I'm excited to be here today to share with you sort of my experience as a leader. And I remember when I first transitioned from being a engineer, software engineer into a leader, I was super excited. You know, I was like power posing all the time, high-fiving people. I was excited because I knew that I would get to pick the projects that I wanted to work on. I would get to lead people through those projects and help them solve problems along the way. Unfortunately, a few weeks into me being a leader, I noticed that things weren't really going as I had imagined in my head. Instead, I was being pulled into a lot of different meetings. And when I wasn't sitting in a meeting trying to figure out why I was there, I would be pulled by my direct reports or other teams to help resolve issues, which I didn't mind because again, I had been an engineer. But just all the context switching really made me feel unaccomplished at the end of the day. And having been an engineer, it was kind of in my DNA to have something that I start with and then finish and you know, have something tangible at the end of the day. So I really missed that feeling of accomplishment. And I started to think about how I could get that feeling back. So I came up with a scheme where I would wake up a few hours earlier than my team and I would write some code at home. Then I would go into the office and be present with my team direct reports, sit in the meetings, help them solve any issues they had. And then later in the evening, I would go back to writing some code. This scheme worked for a couple of weeks until again, I noticed it was breaking down. And it started to break down because when I was in meetings throughout the day, I wasn't fixing bugs that my code had caused. And since we were a team that really cared about continuous deployment and continuous integration, I had become a bottleneck. Instead of giving my code over to my teammates, I kind of became a hoarder. And I was really reluctant to give it, instead wanted to fix all the bugs myself. To make matters worse, I got some pretty candid feedback that I wasn't doing a good job as an engineer or as a first time leader. And that's when I realized I needed to do better and I needed to pick one. So I enlisted a outside advisor, someone who I trusted to come and shadow me and to see what I was doing wrong. What were the things that I needed to do better as a first time leader? And one of the things that my advisor had mentioned was that I was spending too much time in the weeds, kind of doing things. And instead, I needed to get better at scaling myself. And that's what I'm here to talk to you today about is how to scale yourself as a first time leader. Hi, I'm Pornima Vijay Shankar. I was previously the founding engineer at Mint.com, the personal finance app. I helped build the prototype, launch it and scale it until its eventual acquisition in 2009. And then I transitioned to being the founder of BizEV, which was a customer relationship management solution for small businesses. And now I'm the founder of Femgineer, an education company where we help techies like yourselves level up in your careers. I've also been an entrepreneur in residence at 500 Startups, the lead mentor in residence at Techstars, and I've authored two books, How to Transform Your Ideas into Software Products and Present a Techie's Guide to Public Speaking. If you like my talk today, then I highly recommend checking out my YouTube channel, Femgineers, for a lot of uh, other great content. So with that, let's get back to the topic. The first thing that my advisor told me at the first time leaders should do in terms of scaling themselves is to build a self-sufficient team. I was kind of confused by this. 
And I was like, why is a self-sufficient team important? I mean, if I'm the leader, shouldn't I be the linchpin? Shouldn't people be coming to me for guidance and advice and to solve problems? And I realized that uh, there was something kind of disconnected in building a self-sufficient team. But my advisor said, you know, what I was doing was that I wasn't building trust. If I truly trusted my team, then they would be off solving problems on their own. They would have the knowledge, they would have the tools and the resources to make it happen. But instead I was kind of micromanaging them and doing everything for them because I truly didn't trust my team. And that's not how I felt. I did feel like they were capable, but I wasn't showing it through my actions. The second thing that my advisor mentioned was bus factor. So I created kind of a bus factor of one where I was the bottleneck and this was evident by me hoarding my code. And I needed to move away from that because it meant that anytime something happened to me, then the entire team or like the progress of the product would come to a standstill. So I needed to move away from that. And finally, my advisor kind of mentioned the benefits of doing this. The benefits were one, people would not burn out as much, which means there would be low turnover. They could do things like take a vacation and actually take a vacation, not check email. And also, if I set things up correctly, there would be enough knowledge on the team, some redundancy, so that even one person being absent wouldn't slow down the overall progress of our product and meeting our company's goals. I personally experienced the benefits of these a couple years ago when I had my first baby and I needed to go on maternity leave and really be present throughout the entire parental leave. And I remember that because I had a self-sufficient team, I could do this. I didn't have to constantly check in. I didn't have to wonder who was doing what. Things kind of continued while I got to benefit spending time with my little one. But of course, there are some caveats. I know that things right now are kind of in flux, maybe with your company culture, especially in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. You might have had an in-house team that's transitioning into a distributed team, or maybe your distributed team has grown, kind of added some more time zones, and you as a leader, whether it's your first time or you know, maybe you're more senior, are kind of wondering how can I make sure that I'm staying true to my company's culture. So I'm gonna tackle some of those transitions, but the one thing I want you to keep in mind is I'm not handing you the gospel. What I'm gonna suggest have been things that have worked for me as I've been through some transitions with companies, but also what I've coached other senior leaders who are technical uh, all the way from first time to CTOs. And I recommend that you kind of pick and choose, but figure out what's gonna work within your organization. So if you're in a company where the expectation is that you will be writing some code, you'll be doing some technical work and managing people, and you feel like you're overwhelmed by it, then it might be time to talk to your manager to figure out if that makes the most sense, uh, or if there is a transition period, or if you need to kind of rethink the role itself. So as I was getting started, there were three areas I knew that I needed to scale. The first was the product. We were moving from a prototype, or rather we needed to move from a prototype to a service-oriented architecture because we were experiencing a lot of customer growth. The second was I needed to scale the product development process so that it could continue in the midst of any absences I had or other things I needed to do. And the third was to deal with people issues as they came up and to not always be the linchpin, but still be able to manage my direct reports and give them the tools they needed to do their day-to-day -day work and still feel fulfilled in their careers. So when I started off, my advisor suggested that I start by leading by influence and not authority. And maybe some of you have heard this. I know when I first heard this, I was like, well, what, what does that mean? And I almost felt like it was kind of a management mantra, but because my advisor was a veteran in the industry, I decided to give them the benefit of the doubt and they kind of dug into what it meant. Essentially, I was telling my team what to do all the time. I was micromanaging them. Instead, I needed to tell them the what in terms of what needed to be done and the why, why it needed to be done. 
but then leave the how up to them. And I also, in doing this, would need to figure out when it was appropriate to kind of step into situations to help them out, and when I should let them sort of resolve matters on their own, figure things out on their own. So I decided to start small. And I recall the first meeting when I was pulling together all my direct reports. The thing that was most important was to talk about how we needed to move from this prototype into the service oriented architecture. And the reason being we were growing as a company with more customers every day. So when I called the meeting, I laid this out and then I quickly shut up. Like I literally kept my mouth shut as, as best as I could throughout that meeting and let my team sort of run things. And sure enough, within a couple of minutes, people started chiming in. You know, one engineer raised their hand and said, I have an idea. I think if we're going to do this, then we really need to make sure we pay down technical debt. And in order to successfully pay down technical debt, we need to have a better testing infrastructure. And then another one raised their hand and said, yeah, we definitely need to do test-driven development. So all of a sudden, there was this great brainstorming clamoring happening, and I didn't really need to say anything because they already had ideas. Of course, I knew a lot about test-driven development. I knew a lot about testing infrastructure, but I just continued to let them run things. And what was interesting is I was essentially learning how to delegate, delegate away the things that I had previously done and let my team kind of steer the ship. And I was giving them a lot of autonomy. I was letting them do all the research, all the implementation, and this is gonna sound a little controversial because a lot of times people in management don't like this, but I even let them go so far as to set their own deadlines. Reasonable ones, you know, not like ones into the future that are so nebulous that they'll never happen, but kind of small or shorter ones that we could have frequent check-ins. The reason I did this is because I felt like having some sort of artificially imposed deadline from management just seemed off. If they were truly on the front lines, then they would figure out how long things would take. And if they got it wrong here or there, they would quickly course correct and know for the next time around. So I let them set their own sort of short deadlines. And then of course they're like, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna <laughs> go off and have fun? Like, no, I certainly had responsibilities as well. So my responsibilities were to do check-ins uh, along the cadence that made sense so I wasn't interfering with their productivity. But any time that they needed help, making sure they were on track, reviewing their results, as well as mentoring and coaching people and filling in any knowledge gaps. So essentially, I was just serving as guardrails. I wasn't going to be doing the work. They were going to be doing the work, but I would be there to help them through any sticky points they had. So I'm going to stop right here uh, before I go on to kind of the next segment and see if anybody has any questions. If anyone has any questions, just feel free to jump into the Q&A and I will get those answered for you and I can keep them anonymous if you'd prefer um, or just share your first name. Um, so one question that I have is actually from Paul. Um, can you describe how you give direction to ensure a self-sufficient team? Many engineers work on multiple projects and how does the leader give direction on the order of importance so that there is no fl flailing? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point. That can be tough when people have multiple projects. So I think the first thing as a, a leader is you need to get clear on the goals and the priorities uh, for yourself and for the company, right? So this means meeting with whoever is your manager if there are multiple projects. And sometimes the people are in like different departments that you're dealing with since there are multiple projects. Um, so kind of figuring out maybe what is the one that has the most at stake for the company or is something that uh, people really want to do because they want to get a customer uh, or it's just general like hygiene that needs to be done and somebody's got to prioritize it, right? So this, this takes a bit of practice. It's never right the first, I don't know, 100 times. <laughs> um, but the idea still is to kind of ga gauge uh, and to also see if maybe people bit off more than they could chew. Because a lot of times engineers might have four or five projects and that's just 
frankly, too many uh, in my book. So if it starts to get overwhelming, then either a couple things need to happen. One, the project needs to be kind of rescoped or figure out what the new deadline is. Two, you have to staff up, right? Hire more people because one engineer can't manage all of it. Or figure out ways in which you can combine the projects to where it makes sense. Like, are there pieces of it that are overlapping so that in the engineer's mind, um, they will <clears throat> know like, okay, I'm gonna do this piece first and the second and third. Uh, and a lot of times managers will do this work, but a lot of times product managers or project managers will actually come in. So it's important to figure out what your company's um, org is, org structure, uh, and then kind of play to that. So if it's definitely gonna be a PM, then working with the PMs to make sure people are getting work done and not feeling overwhelmed and that the projects have been scoped correctly. Um, but if you don't have that and it's just like managers and engineers, then it's worthwhile for the manager to kind of go to a project management class to kind of get a sense of it. Um, I always like to focus on goals first and then sort of carve out when it makes sense to release things. Uh, and then the other thing is just getting approval like, hey, it's more important to deliver something that's finished rather than a bunch of like half-baked things, right? So that your engineers feel that sense of accomplishment. Um, but ultimately what this means is having those weekly one-on-ones with your engineers so that they're able to expose to you when they feel overwhelmed, when they feel like a project is off track, uh, or when they feel like, you yeah, maybe there's just too many projects and things need to be reevaluated. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Thank you so much. Any other questions that anyone has? Otherwise we can move forward. Sure. Um, it looks like we are all set right now, but if anyone does have any questions, just feel free to jump them or drop them in there. Thanks so much. Cool. So kind of coming back to the topic, one question I get asked a lot is does team composition matter? And I get where people are coming from. Really what they're asking for is, should we have a team of a lot of junior people or senior people or mix, you know, what does that look like? And I think frankly, experience level doesn't matter because I've certainly worked with a lot of junior engineers who are capable, great communicators and coachable so that they level up very quickly and get things done. And then I've dealt with senior people who are super brilliant but kind of stuck in the mud and it's hard to coach them and get them to do things, right? Or they're kind of always contesting. And so my suggestion is both people are necessary, but really what you want is a team, again, who is coachable, who's going to communicate and is willing to learn new things uh, to kind of get over those stumbling blocks. That to me is an appropriate composition, not necessarily the experience level. So coming back to the situation I was in with my team, I am happy to report that about eight weeks in, my team was able to successfully deliver the first version of our testing infrastructure. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There were definitely some stumbling blocks along the way uh, that I had to help coach them through, but they were able to get that V1 out the door, which was a great motivator for them because it helped them to realize that they could operate without me they could make decisions and anytime they were concerned, they had a little bit of a safety net, someone to come back to, uh, to make sure that they were staying on track. One idea that I had after this initial project was to implement postmortems once a quarter, because I noticed as we were doing this project, there were a lot of process issues that were coming up. And so I set this postmortem up and I suggested that we all kind of get together air our grievances around what worked uh, in terms of process, and then as a team vote on one to two process changes. The reason I limited it was because change of behavior is really tough for people, especially if you're in an organization that's fast moving, and it can be also hard to tell what is and isn't working. So one to two process changes, and sometimes there would be none, sometimes things would be going well and we just didn't wanna rock the boat, uh, but this was a way for us to take stock and to see what was truly working, kind of change our methodology as we needed to and as we grew as a team. So again, I'm gonna pause right here if anybody has any questions 
based on what I've covered so far. And if not, we can keep going. I think we are set to keep moving forward. Thank you so much. Great. Sure. Okay. So it took me about a year to get to a point where I felt like I was starting to scale the product as well as the product development process. And it was time for me to change my attention to focusing on improving how I dealt with people. And I've got to admit that on most teams I've worked with, I have worked with some very, very technically talented people. So I've never had huge issues, but there are times where conflict arises and sometimes things get a little bit emotional. So when I first started uh, on this particular team I was working at when I was a first time leader, I was sort of blessed to have two amazing engineers. Let's call them Sam and Dakota. Maybe you have these folks on your team. You know, they're just like BFFs. They loved pair programming. They loved getting coffee together. They would even spend time on the weekends going to hackathons or just hanging out. And I had known them for about six months. So over that course of time, I felt like their relationship was pretty harmonious. And you can imagine how surprised I was when I walked in one day and noticed that Sam and Dakota were standing on opposite sides of the room, kind of looking annoyed and were drinking their coffee by themselves. I didn't know what was going on. So I decided to kind of set my things down and then get to the bottom of what was happening. Soon enough, Sam approached me and asked to take a conference room. So we walked into a conference room and Sam proceeded to unload. Sam mentioned how there had been a nasty customer issue and Sam had come up with a solution to it, had asked Dakota to code review it. Dakota code reviewed it, but rejected it and came up with their own solution that, and said it was very robust and that it would meet the needs of the customers and that that was the solution that needed to be deployed. Sam was taken aback because his solution was just totally dismissed and thought that Dakota was just kind of acting out of turn instead of like helping and kind of collaborating, just sort of telling Sam what to do and felt like I needed to fire Dakota because Dakota just wasn't being a team player. So I listened to Sam's story and said I would get back to them and then turned my attention to Dakota. Uh, when Dakota walked into the conference room, Dakota had mentioned how, again, there had been a nasty customer issue and had reviewed Sam's solution. It was, a, it was an okay solution. It wasn't great. It, there were a lot of issues that Sam had not thought about and Dakota's solution was certainly more robust and Dakota was being an advocate for customers as well as the company and felt like Sam was not being very coachable, just kind of thinking of themselves and that I should probably fire someone like Sam for not being a team player. And so in that moment, I was like, okay, thank you for telling me your side of the story. And as I, after I was done listening to them, I sort of thought about what I needed to do. It was really tempting to just kind of sit them both down and tell them how to resolve their issue. But again, I had about six months of knowledge working with them. And I felt like this was maybe a one-time issue. Uh, it was their first time getting into a conflict and I felt like maybe they needed to learn how to resolve it on their own. So instead of stepping in, I gave them a framework. I suggested that they take a week, take the first couple days to cool down, think about their story, share it with one another, listen to each other fully uninterrupted, and then see if they could kind of meet each other halfway. And if they were truly at an impasse at the end of the week, I would be happy to step in and resolve their conflict. So about a week went by. Fortunately, we didn't have any major customer issues. Nobody got fired. <laughs> Nobody killed each other. And at the end of the week, they magically, and this is very magical, it's like a fairy tale for a first time leader, they sorted things out. And when I approached them at the end of the week to see how they sorted things out, the first thing they did was they actually thanked me. They thanked me for trusting them 
and not just stepping in and telling them what to do, but for treating them like adults. And they thought that if I could trust them, like each one of them to sort things out, then they should probably trust each other. So they came up with a way to resolve the conflict. And they also noticed that there had been some minor squabbles in the past that sort of went unresolved. And so some of that bubbled up and I got a little bit of a bigger picture uh, as they were telling me how they went about doing it. Now, the one thing I decided to do to kind of scale this again was to share the story of Sam and Dakota with the rest of the team so that everyone could see that conflict was normal, but to also show them that I wasn't gonna always be there to resolve their conflict and to give them that framework for what kind of a first response looked like you know, how they could take a stab at resolving the conflict. And then if things were truly out of hand, I would be there to listen and to help resolve it. So it took about two years and I finally was getting the hang of scaling the product, the process, as well as the people. And one of the things that happened <clears throat> in the midst of this, uh, of me becoming a first time leader, which I think is highly relevant to today, was we actually started to transition from being a in-house team where we all work together to a truly distributed team. And I know a lot of you are kind of going through this, which is why I wanted to share some of the things that were important to us. So the catalyst for this was that we were all living in different parts of the Bay Area and traffic was just getting to be a nightmare um, to the point where a couple of the engineers were gonna stage a coup uh, one way or the other and get their point across to management that something, something needed to happen uh, because they didn't want to be spending an hour or two hours in traffic when they could be spending that doing something else. So we decided to kind of give it a test run uh, one quarter and see if we could really do the transition and stay on task and you know, make sure that things didn't fall by the wayside. There were three areas that I in particular was concerned about. The first was communication breakdowns. And this was like the era before Slack, um, but we had kind of our own ways of communicating. We had Campfire, which was uh, an early predecessor to Slack. But I didn't think that you know, just having a tool was sufficient. I felt like what we needed to do was have a protocol for how we would communicate. So as a team and then later as a company, we sat down and came up with a way in which we can escalate communication. You know, the first was just like a light touch email. The second was putting it into now what would be like a Slack. Uh, and then if something was really on fire, either because of a customer issue or something else going on, then, you know, text message. And this scheme really worked out. The other thing for myself was to make sure I was keeping uh, on track with my direct reports meeting with them weekly, making sure that I had scheduled those one-on-ones and I was hearing them out. Uh, and still having like all hands with the team so that people would uh, get a chance to know what was going on with the company. And then as a smaller team, uh, having daily standups to kind of gauge people's status and what they were blocked on and what was working. The second after communication was to make sure that people were productive. And this for recovering micromanagers is really tough on a remote team because you automatically assume people aren't working. But what's funny is that no matter what the job function is, whether it's marketing or engineering, it becomes pretty obvious quickly. If you are doing those frequent check-ins, if you are having like a way to monitor people's progress. And so for us, we were already doing things like using Pivotal Tracker to track our projects, to do daily deployments, et cetera. So it was pretty clear when like somebody wasn't pulling their weight. And it didn't really matter what tool we used as long as we had a process behind it. And that process was, you know, every two weeks we would have a sprint. Uh, we would check what the work was, you know, do a demo or something like that. And then because we were constantly doing code reviews and peer programming, we, we knew when people were staying on top of their work and when people were either stuck um, so we always give people the benefit of the doubt. And then the third was company morale. So it's not enough to have the first two. Also want to make sure that people feel connected. And this can be really tough, especially now, where people are just worried every day by something new. 
So one of the things that we tried to do was have uh, team meetings where it was just kind of casual. You know, we might play a video game, we might just hang out, have water cooler conversation, but have, have it be things that are not necessarily related to product or the company. Uh, and then we would also try once uh, a year to have a company retreat, something fun. And then in between every six months, just kind of meet up face to face. Uh, and by this point, like our team had gotten pretty distributed. So it was nice to pull people in from different states and have them meet as well. And that I think really helped us stay connected as we were making the transition. So for your company, I think it's helpful to talk to your team, figure out ways in which you can still feel connected as you are making that transition from being a pure in-house team or maybe some hybrid uh, to a distributed team. So uh, I was happy to report that after all of this work, all these transitions, that uh, I was able to kind of level up as a first time leader scale myself. And I owe a lot of it to my trusted advisor being there for me. You know, they taught me how to lead with influence instead of authority. And one of the things that I know might be uh, worrisome for you is, okay, where do I get started? Like she's talking about leading by influence, authority, there are all these things that have happened, you know, pr product, process, people, but like what's kind of a simple thing. But really what I, where I started with was my to-do list. I just took stock of the recurring tasks that I had been doing over and over again and that some I didn't need to do. You know, maybe I was better at it than other people in the team, but then it was my responsibility as a leader to level people up to coach them. So writing code became one of those tasks that I needed to hand over, explaining to people how to write the code, you know, kind of influencing them. Uh, and then I, I thought about the things that I truly needed to invest in, you know, meeting with my direct reports, doing some of that project management that Paul had talked about, uh, and also making sure that I knew what was going on in uh, the overall company, uh, not just the product. So think about how you can take stock of those to-dos and what are the things that you absolutely need to do and what are some things that you could hand off to other people and coach them to improve on and that's more of their job function. And finally, you know, I certainly struggled with that sense of accomplishment that I wasn't feeling because I wasn't doing engineering work every day. But what I learned was that I was developing new skills. And sure, it took like, you know, three months to two years for some of those skills to manifest into goals. But that was something I had to just get comfortable with if I was going to be a leader, that things were not going to come immediately. It would kind of take repeated effort, kind of different approaches, getting coaching for myself, um, and kind of working through a number of situations, a number of projects. And finally, I was getting better at learning when it was appropriate to step in and when I needed to let my team kind of run things for me. I didn't always need to be there. I didn't always need to be present. I certainly didn't always need to be the person making the decision. All right, so that is all I have for today. If you would like to stay in touch, I am on Twitter. You can certainly check out my website, FemGineer, as well. And with the remaining time, I'd like to open it up to more questions. Thank you so much, Cornema. Um, we do have Thank one you. question from Graham. Um, he's wondering about coaching techniques that maybe you'd recommend. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I'm trying to think of the name of the book. Usually I put a book list here. I'm sorry, I left it off. Uh, I, can, I can recall it and send it over. But uh, I know Laura um, Hogan has a great book out on some coaching techniques that she refers to because a lot of times people get coaching and mentoring confused uh, where kind of mentoring is when you sort of share your own experience and hopefully the people on the other side learn a nugget or two so kind of what i've done today is probably more mentoring coaching is when you take some time first to assess the person that you're coaching and sometimes this can be a self-assessment where they do like a questionnaire, survey, something like that, a strengths finder. Uh, but I, I, those are good. Uh, but I think one step further is to also spend some time shadowing them, you know, see what they're doing, whether this is an engineer or another manager or something else, 
just kind of get a sense of how they operate. Uh, and that'll help you to see how they take feedback, um, maybe even expose some of their blind spots uh, and have sort of deeper conversations with them. Um, but I feel like those are the first two things that need to happen is have a survey or questionnaire, help them self-assess, and then you take some time to follow them along. Um, and then the last thing I will say is have it be, uh, I, I like to do coaching sessions pretty much every week for like a three month period and then kind of reevaluate whether more coaching is needed or not. And the reason I say this is because if too much time passes, then kind of what you said just falls by the wayside. And when you have these more frequent sessions, people can kind of reevaluate, oh, okay, I tried this technique or I tried that, or maybe I didn't get time to, so I'll do it again. Um, and I really like to kind of list out what the progress is. The last thing I will say is, um, before you get into the coaching, is have a couple goals. So what is it that the person that you're coaching, or if you're the person receiving the coaching, like what do you want to accomplish? And make them realistic, right? So if it's, I want to lead a 100-person company, and this is your first time leading, that's probably unrealistic, right? But if it's instead, hey, I want to lead one project over the next quarter, that's realistic. Can you get coaching or can you coach somebody to do that? And maybe thinking through what are the things that they're going to need to learn in order to uh, achieve that goal, right? So set maybe one to three goals that you can accomplish in that coaching period. Uh, and then think about the, the things that you know uh, that, have, uh, that are proven techniques, right? So it's not just like it worked for you, but it's worked for other multiple people and in like different situations. Um, a lot of people, you know, in, when they're doing interviews, they use this STAR method, situation, forget the other two things. Uh, it's like achievements, results, I forget what T is. But you kind of want to do the same thing when you're coaching. You want to figure out what's the situation they're in, what's kind of a, a technique that could be applied to achieve some goal, and then do they see those results or do you need to recalibrate? Um, so that's kind of my gist. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I have another question um, from Bob. He's wondering, is there any tips on scaling yourself for leadership that you report to? Um, so as an example, I need to do more budgeting and business planning. Any tips from, for transitioning from an engineering role into those areas of leadership? Um, I guess my follow-up is you want to learn these techniques, Bob? I think it's um, transitioning from an engineering role into those areas of leadership like business. Yes, that is correct. Um, so okay. transitioning into more of the budgeting and business planning. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that would be helpful coming back to the same, I know I'm going to end up kind of repeating myself, but uh, shadowing somebody who is already doing this, preferably in your org, because you might have a specific way of doing your budgeting and your planning. Um, and if not, then you could certainly go out into another org. But just, I feel like shadowing somebody for a few weeks to get the hang of it and then doing it yourself, maybe getting some feedback from your manager or whoever else you might be taking over this role um, or they might have some expectations. So doing kind of a trial run is very helpful. So that you gain the confidence, but also if you feel like, I don't like doing this budgeting, ew, like I don't wanna do that anymore, then you get a trial and no one's you know gonna fire you for it so i would say start off with how can you acquire these skills in sort of uh, a simple way you know you don't have to sign up for like a 10-week program you don't have to immediately take on the role uh, and have a huge reorg there's kind of daily steps um, and you might even ask whoever is currently doing this like what's a reasonable time frame uh for me to maybe budget one project or one quarter and what are some things that i need to watch out for as i'm doing this right so get get some help along the way um but that's that, that's how i would say start the transition process uh, i always find it's helpful if you sort of do the work before you do the formal transition rather than like all of a sudden you've transitioned to the role and then you don't really know how to do certain things or some of your expectations are, are also out of alignment with what your boss or uh, higher up management wants from you. 
Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I do have one more question um, sure. from Paul. So experience has been that it is sometimes it sometimes takes time for the team to accept the new leader and they need to feel out their new leaders technical capabilities. Do you have any recommendations on how to approach that situation. We can't know it all jumping right in right. Absolutely. It's that's actually a great question. Um, and it came up today at lunch when I was talking to my husband about it. Uh, some of the previous managers I've had where people are very quick to jump in, solve problems, show off their knowledge. Uh, and then the team is like, okay, well, who invited, you know, Mr. and Ms. Know-it-all? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think similar to coaching again, feel the team out. And part of that can be, hey, uh, I'd like to have some meetings where maybe people just openly talk about what they're working on to see what the various projects are. Um, but I think it's valuable to see how teams work together uh, and then how each individual kind of responds to one another, but also what each person is working on. Um, there's this great book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Maybe some of you know it. And uh, the, the gist of the book is there's a new leader that kind of jumps into a team where there's absolutely no trust. And it almost feels like you know, you just want to throw away the team and start fresh, but we don't always have that luxury. Uh, spoiler alert, the leader over time gains trust, but there are some great, I would say, uh, examples of how they build trust over time. Uh, and one of the things is definitely not always jumping in to show your knowledge, show your expertise, but see what the team already has first uh, and kind of play to that. And then I think, you know, if there are some knowledge gaps that you see, that's an appropriate time to either one on one or with the whole team say like, hey, I noticed uh, that y'all don't know how to do X or am I mistaken, like somebody here does and maybe just hasn't happened yet. Um, but if not, I'd be happy to do a quick presentation, share my knowledge of it uh, and then see if anybody has any questions. Right. So kind of have it be. Um, a casual <laughs> conversation instead of like, well, this is how we did things at company X and this is what I worked on at company Y. And that's why I think this applies. Uh, Cause that's just a very quick way to lose trust and lose uh, morale on a team when you don't know um, what stage they're at. Uh, and then I think another piece is to really think about if you do have that knowledge, how do you plan to transfer it? Um, one company I worked with about a year ago, the CTO was just like the linchpin and knew everything about all the projects and all the, you know, various clients, um, but was getting exhausted. I was like, hey, have you ever thought about pair programming or mob programming so that you can start to transfer some of your knowledge to other people? And it was, it was a very simple suggestion, right? But his eyes kind of lit up and was like, yeah, I know I need to do that more. Um, so let me kind of start with some people who I can do that with. And over a six month period was able to transition out of being that linchpin. So I think figuring out some low touch ways that you can transfer your knowledge so that the team sees that the knowledge you have is valuable. Um, it's kind of eager to learn from you and then can run off and you know, implement this and you don't always have to be that uh, bottleneck. Amazing. Thank you. Is there sure. any more questions that we want to ask before we end? Um, I do just want to thank everyone for coming and being a part of the talk. Um, I want to say a special thank you to Gentex um, and Chris to, uh, for sponsoring this talk. Obviously, Pornima for taking the time out of your day to, um, to give us the message. We really appreciate it. For everyone that's listening, um, we will be posting this out um, so that you can follow um, if you missed anything or you want to follow back up or share with anyone else that you um, that you um, that didn't get to catch it. And then we will have another talk um, coming up next month. Um, so look for that and make sure that you register there. Um, are there any other questions at all before we let everyone go or is everyone good? I put a couple of the book recommendations in the chat. 
um, and then also Gentex website. Um, so go check those out as well. With that, I, I guess I just want to say thank you again, Gentex. Thank you so much, Pornima, for the wonderful talk. Um, and everyone, have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Gentex.